In 1943, it was one of our strategic aims to draw as many German forces as possible away from the Russian front and French coastal areas and to contain them on the Italian peninsula while liberating as much of Italy as might be possible with the means at our disposal. As the bulk of our supplies was directed to England for the forthcoming invasion, operations in Italy had to be conducted on an extremely limited scale. Thus it came about that during the winter months, the number of Allied divisions in Italy was greatly reduced. Yet so determined was their effort that they succeeded in holding in Italy a very large number of German divisions during the pre-invasion period. San Pietro in the 5th Army sector was the key to the Leary Valley. We knew it and the enemy knew it. We had to take it even though the immediate cost would be high. We took it and the cost in relation to the later advance was not excessive. By its very nature, this success worked bitter hardships upon each individual soldier, calling for the full measure of his courage and devotion. The response of our 5th Army troops provides an inspiring page in our military history. To these individuals, living and dead, and to those who now continue in their tradition, this picture is dedicated. Valley lies in the Italian Midland, some 60 miles northwest of Naples to some 40 miles southeast of Rome. A wide, flat corridor enclosed between four walls of mountains. In winter, the highest peaks of the Leary Range ascend into the snows, but the valley floor with its olive groves and ancient vines, its crops of wheat and corn, is green the year around. That is, in normal times. Last year was a bad year for grapes and olives, and the fall planting was late. Many fields lay fallow. There are two ways from the south into the valley, one a narrow pass, the other a high scenic road over the mountains. They converge before the site of the ancient village of San Pietro, which for 700 years has stood at the threshold of Leary Valley, welcoming the traveler. The stones of its walls were quarried out of the parent hill from whose slopes it rises. Population 1,412 at the last census. A farming community. Patron saint, Peter. Point of interest, St. Peter's, 1438. Note, interesting treatment of chancel. From the end of October 1943 until the middle of December, San Pietro and the surrounding ground was the scene of some of the bitterest fighting on our Fifth Army front. The Italian campaign had entered its second phase, to push forward again after a static period brought on by heavy seasonal rains. Our battle lines were haphazard as the terrain itself, with its flood-swollen rivers that twisted back and forth across our line of march so that each river seemed like five. And where there was no river to cross, a mountain blocked our going, each peak ahead being a few meters higher than the last we had won, so that each new peak had to be fought for, the hard, uphill way, with the enemy looking down our throats. They had had time to fortify and camouflage their positions. 
No amount of artillery fire or aerial bombardment could force them to withdraw. That was for the infantry to do, employing those weapons that can find and destroy life in narrow trenches, caves, and fighting holes. It was up to the man with the rifle, the man under fire from all weapons, the man whose way all our weapons, land, air, and sea, serve only to prepare. It was up to the foot soldier to attack a hidden enemy over ground that was sown with mines, the anti-personnel S mines, that fly up at a footfall to explode beneath the groin. Nowhere along the entire front were enemy preparations more elaborate than the San Pietro area. For San Pietro stands at the threshold of Leary Valley, and through Leary Valley, wide and level, runs the most highly prized length of road south of Rome. By early December, we had taken were holding high ground to the northeast, east, and south of San Pietro, the Camino Maggiore hill mass being last to fall. An Italian brigade under Allied command had made a vain attempt to capture Mount Lungo, possession of which would have acted greatly to our benefit in the impending action. The Italians were all but annihilated. In view of their excessive losses, further operations against Mount Lungo's strategic heights were abandoned. And it was decided to make a direct frontal assault on enemy positions in and around San Pietro. Elements of the 36th Texas Infantry Division were rotated from position to position overlooking the valley so the troops might study the terrain ahead from various viewpoints. Patrol activity was continuous. Day and night, units went out to reconnoiter the ground, draw fire, take prisoners, thus adding to the sum of our information about the enemy. High points, Mount Lungo's 351 and Mount Simucro's 1205 and 950 were all manned in force. The town itself was strongly garrisoned with numerous mortar, machine gun, and heavy weapon emplacements. Four enemy battalions were dug into a line of connecting trenches and mutually supporting pillboxes in depth that extended from the base of Mount Lungo northeast across the valley floor to the base of Mount Simucro. Another battalion was organized to defend the high ground northwest of San Pietro. Areas before these positions were heavily mined and held a confusion of barbed wire and booby traps. On the afternoon before, D-Day and H-Hour were communicated to battalion commanders. December 8th, at 0620 hours, the 1st Battalion of the 143rd Infantry Regiment to attack the summit of 1205, having moved up the mountain under cover of darkness, and upon achieving its objective, to attack along the ridge to a point northwest of San Pietro. The 3rd Ranger Battalion likewise to attack 950, another feature of the Mount Simocro hill mass. The 2nd Battalion of the 143rd to attack over the terraced olive orchards northeast of San Pietro. The 3rd Battalion acting in support to follow the 2nd at 400 yards. Of the original force to establish the beachhead at Salerno, the 143rd had since spent all but a fortnight in action under extremely bitter weather conditions. At Salerno, at the Volturno crossing, it had taken mortal punishment. The task ahead promised no less bloodshed, yet it was undertaken in good spirits and high confidence. The 1st Battalion began the long, rugged climb up Mount Simucro. As night fell, our artillery opened up. And throughout the night hours, intense fire was laid down on the enemy's main line of resistance.
had rained most of the night. And it was raining at each hour when the second and third battalions crossed the line of departure. Some 200 yards forward, they encountered mines and automatic fire from pillboxes. Mortar and artillery were deadly accurate by reason of excellent enemy observation from Mount Lungo, overlooking our advance which continued another 200 to 400 yards. Many men gave their lives in attempts to reach pillboxes and throw hand grenades through the narrow gun openings. The 3rd Battalion was committed. never got more than 600 yards past the line of departure. Our initial assault on San Pietro had been repulsed with heavy casualties. The attack on Hill 1205, however, was a brilliant success. Leading elements of the 1st Battalion had gained the summit of the objective before a strongly entrenched enemy knew that an assault was in progress. To the right of 1205, the 3rd Ranger Battalion had also captured its objective. But only after successive attacks and costly casualties for on 950, the enemy was not taken unaware. Counterattacks were to be expected on both 1205 and 950. They were not long developing. during the early daylight hours, and even as it was beaten off, another took form. Day and night they followed in unremitting violence. The toll of enemy dead mounted with each new attempt. German prisoners captured on 1205 and 950 said they had been ordered to retake those positions at all cost. In addition to defending Hill 1205, the 1st Battalion, obedient to the field order, undertook the reduction of enemy defenses which were organized along the ridge running west. December, the 1st Battalion was reinforced with the 504th Parachute Battalion, which took over and maintained the defenses of 1205 and 950. 
thereby enabling the 1st Battalion to throw its entire remaining strength into the assault along the ridge. But the first strength had dwindled and shrunk in the five days past, and there was now a question as to whether its existing numbers were sufficient to prevail. Reports during the night of the 14th of December stated that the enemy was offering bitter resistance and that the issue was in grave doubt. Meanwhile, on the Ali terraces below, the second and third battalions had twice again attempted to reach their objective. Both times they had come up against a wall of automatic weapon, mortar and artillery fire. Volunteer patrols made desperate attempts to reach enemy positions and reduce strong points. Not a single member of any such patrol ever came back alive. Our attacking forces were furnished excellent aerial cover by Allied fighter patrols. But now and then, enemy planes were able to slip through and to bomb and strafe our positions, which to all purposes had remained unchanged since the first day. To break the deadlock, orders were given for a coordinated divisional attack. The 2nd and 3rd battalions of the 143rd to proceed in the execution of the original orders. Acting in conjunction, Company A of the 753rd Tank Battalion to attack San Pietro from the east over the high road. One battalion of the 141st to attack over the flat valley floor. After nightfall on D-Day, the 142nd Infantry Regiment to attack Mount Lungo. The earlier decision not to attack those strategic heights having been reversed in view of the present critical situation. In preparation for the attack, all 5th Army artillery within range, including tanks and all tracks, was directed against San Pietro and the surrounding area. hour, 1,200 hours, D-Day, the 15th of December. The 141st Infantry advanced some 400 yards from its line of departure to be borne down and held powerless under the weight of enemy fire. The 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 143rd advanced some 100 yards beyond their former positions to a point almost directly before forward enemy defenses. And for the third time, they were forced to take such cover as the quaking earth could offer. And the tanks. Orders were for them to enter the town to locate and destroy the heavy weapons there, which were leveled against our attacking foot soldiers. The high road into San Pietro is a narrow mountain road, and from the beginning of its winding descent in the Leary Valley, it was under direct enemy observation. Sixteen tanks started down that road. Three reached the outskirts of the town.
destroyed and one was missing. Five tanks were immobilized behind enemy lines, their crews having to abandon them. Five tanks hit enemy mines within our lines and were thereupon destroyed by enemy gunfire. Four tanks returned to the bivouac area. After dark, two companies, one from the 2nd Battalion and one from the 3rd, finally succeeded in penetrating enemy positions before San Pietro. But receiving both frontal and flanking fire, they were forced to retire. Company E having been reduced in strength to a handful of riflemen, and Company L faring little better. On the Mount Simocro Ridge, the 1st Battalion fought its way to within a few hundred yards of the objective. But it had paid for ground gained at the rate of a man a yard, and it did not have strength to carry the fight any further forward. On Mount Lungo, however, despite bitter resistance, Battalions of the 142nd, in successive waves, kept pushing upwards. Until, in the early daylight hours of the 16th of December, its foot soldiers had gained the summit and were wiping up what remained of a stubborn enemy. And that height proved to be a key position in the enemy plan of defense. For even as Mount Lungo fell, the enemy throughout the San Pietro area made preparations to withdraw. Almost invariably, the enemy will counterattack to cover a withdrawal. The first violent thrust was delivered within a few hours. And thereafter, counterattacks came in waves, the roar of the last mingling with the rush and fury of the next to break. Many companies lost all their officers. Enlisted men came forward as inspirational leaders to rally their battered companies and resist yet one more onslaught. Our own artillery was brought to fall within a hundred yards of our front line elements. After five hours, during which the earth never ceased to tremble, counterattacks ended indicating the withdrawal of the enemy's main body had commenced. to maintain contact with the enemy, our patrols immediately pushed ahead. Entering the town, they discovered that San Pietro was ours for the taking. The second and third battalions, less than a rifle company in strength, weary to death who were alive, stumbled forward past San Pietro to consolidate gain and re-establish contact with the enemy, now taking up new positions some five kilometers beyond. 
That is the broad shape of the Battle of San Pietro, which was but the first of many battles in Leary Valley. It was a very costly battle. After the battle, the 143rd Infantry Regiment alone required 1,100 replacements. The lives lost were precious lives to their country, to their loved ones and of the men themselves. For the living of the 143rd Infantry Regiment, more than 100 decorations for acts of valor above and beyond the call of duty. Many among these you see alive here have since joined the ranks of their brothers in arms who fell at San Pietro. For ahead lay San Vittore, and the Rapido River, and Casino, and beyond Casino, more rivers, and more mountains, and more towns, more San Pietros, greater or lesser, a thousand more. As the battle passed over and beyond San Pietro, westward, townspeople began to appear, coming out of their caves in the mountains, where they had stayed in hiding during the enemy occupation. They were mostly old people and children. enemy mines and booby traps, which were in the process of being cleared. forget quickly. Yesterday they wept. Today there are smiles and even laughter. Tomorrow it will be as though the bad things have never happened. Living was resumed in San Pietro. Our 
prime military aim being to engage and defeat the enemy, the capture of the town itself and the liberation of its people is of an incidental nature. But the people in their military innocence look upon us solely as their deliverers. It was to free them and their farmlands that we came. Behind our line, southwest to the sea, the fields are green with growing crops planted after our coming by other people of other towns who believed likewise. The new one earth at San Pietro was plowed and sown. It should yield a good harvest this year. And the people prayed to their patron saint to intercede with God in behalf of those who came to deliver them and passed on to the north with the passing battle. It is no show place, this town. Not wealthy, not well known. Before what happened here in December 1944, or even since. For seven days, history paused at a crossroads in this Belgian Ardennes village and then passed on. Unless we can call history the echoes that ring in the memories of the men who make it, as they did in the battle at saint Vith. much time for sleeping, eating at irregular hours. The fact was that everyone and every unit was fighting for its own life. You're going to get it, sub. Maybe this is it. Colonel, a C battery is firing at 150 yards. Cold. When you're cold, you stay cold. There's no way of getting warm. We've got no orders to retire. Und es war nicht möglich, etwa Servit meinerseits vom deutschen Angriff hier auszusparen. In 1944, the German army had been fighting for five years. Allied confidence was high, its strength overwhelming, and the halt in its sweep across Europe at the German frontier regarded as temporary. There, the forces of Field Marshal von Rundstedt held desperately, their calls for reinforcements answered by inferior materials or silence. General Siegfried Westfall, von Rundstedt's chief of staff, recalls these days on the Western Front as the most uneasy he had spent, until the day in late October when he learned the reason for the stubborn silence of the Wehrmacht High Command. Hitler received us and informed us that he was planning a large-scale offensive in the West in the near future. We were going to receive 20 infantry divisions and 10 panzer divisions, newly and completely equipped, and the land operations would be supported by at least 3,000 fighters. The target of this operation, which was to be initiated in the area west and south of Cologne, would be the capture of the port of Antwerp. Three German armies would launch the massive counteroffensive to split the Allied forces and capture their best port of supply, Antwerp. 
What would end as the greatest pitched battle ever fought by American troops, the Battle of the Bulge, would burst without warning on a quiet sector on the First Army Front. In December 1944, it was held in the North by the 2nd and 99th Divisions, by the veteran exhausted 28th and the 4th Divisions to the South, and by the newly arrived 106th, thinly spread at the center. Conditions were fairly miserable. It was intermittently raining and snowing. We were relieving the 2nd Infantry Division. We as a brand new, young, inexperienced division were being moved into their position to take up uh, the defense of that particular sector. We were introduced uh, sort of ironically, as I now recall, uh, because most of the battle-tested veterans of the 2nd Infantry Division uh, kept talking to each one of the units of the 106, talking about what a country club uh, area this was to be. Uh, you would sit here, uh, perhaps some few shots fired each day. I am Thomas J. Riggs, Jr. I was the division engineer of the 106 Infantry Division. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Oliver Patton. In December of 1944, I was a second lieutenant in an infantry company of the 106th Division. The division landed in France and went into the line astraddle straddled the German-Belgian border about the 9th of December, 1944. Looking back on it now, I think probably the division was just about as green as I was, and you couldn't be much greener. I was a second lieutenant just out of Fort Benning. The supervision of all preparations was in the hands of von Rundstedt, Commander-in-Chief West. Participants in the attack were the 6th SS Panzer Army under SS Group Commander-in-Chief Dietrich on the right, the 5th Panzer Army under General of the Panzer Force von Manteuffel, and the 7th Army at the left wing under General Brandenburger for coverage in the south. While the operation was being prepared, it was important above all to keep this a secret from the Allied forces. All movements were made during the night only. All vehicles in the front vicinity were wrapped in straw to keep the noise to a minimum. But nobody could predict how the situation would develop by December 16th. Von Manteuffel, Westfall, von Rudenstedt, Model. From the beginning, Hitler's generals saw no guarantee of success for the counteroffensive. But the Fuhrer was adamant. His plan was irrevocable. Its key elements were surprise, speed, and to prevent Allied air cover, bad weather, as specified in this basic order from the Wehrmacht High Command. The operation will take place only under favorable weather conditions. These will be ordered by the Fuhrer. These sentences induced me to call up headquarters and ironically inquire whether Hitler was now ordering the weather too. The weather did take sides. It was a harsh, confusing enemy to Combat Command B of the 7th Armored Division under General Bruce C. Clark. But the weather was a close ally of 5th Panzer Army Commander General Hasso von Manteuffel. General, I'm reminded of uh, December 1944 when you and I saw these beautiful green and quiet hills uh, all in covered with haze and mist and turning into rain and mud and snow. And I uh, can't help but think uh, how weather played a very important part in that time, as you knew so well. Yes. Ich darf daran erinnern, dass es ja ein Hauptplan war von Hitler. It had been Hitler's plan to start the offensive only during bad weather. And during the days prior to the attack, the weather actually was bad so that the German high command was afraid it might change to clear winter weather and blue skies 
in which case your aerial combat forces might have stopped the attack in its very early stage. In fact, the weather on December 16 was just as you described it now. Visibility was bad. The advanced artillery observers, for instance, would have not been able to make out individual targets on the hill. Die vorgeschobenen Beobachter der Artillerie hätten beispielsweise nicht oben einzelne Ziele auf den Höhen erkennen können. But over there, as you will agree, the riflemen had shields of fire. The tanks were also able to recognize their targets at a distance of 2,000 meters. I therefore started the attack very early, at 5 a.m., as you know, to take advantage of the darkness and the bad weather, which would enable us to advance far into these hills you can see here, a typical Ardennes terrain, by noon. jumped out of the bed, ran downstairs, and rang up division headquarters, which was then about 40 miles away at Wilts. And uh, I got a sleepy major on the phone. I asked him what uh, was going on in the honeymoon sector, and he said he didn't know. And I said, you better find out. I said, there's either a, a major attack or a raid in force going on there, and artillery's coming in like the very mischief. Even though we in the Division CP uh, thought we understood uh, that this was a massive attack, uh, we encountered great difficulty in getting acceptance of this information, or felt we did anyway, through our Corps and Army to our rear. I really believe that they thought that we were a young, untried division and were slightly excited. However, this same type of information began filtering back to them from our neighboring divisions, the 99th on our left and the 28th on our right. The ser seriousness of this situation finally became evident to 8th Corps later in the day, at which point they attached to us uh, primarily the Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division. Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division was led by General William Hogue, who was preparing an attack in the north that morning when his new assignment reached him. I then went to St. Beth and reported to General Jones, commander of the 106th Division. He told me that there was a, an attack all along his front and that two of his regiments were partially surrounded to the east of St. Beth. He did not have a very clear picture as to the nature of the attack, but said it was rather strong. He directed me to move to St. Beth as soon as possible. Later that 
same day, we were also informed by First Army behind 8th Corps, to which we were attached, that the 7th Armored Division would attack through San Viz to our east, and that we were to hold these routes, which were quite vital and a strategic road net in that area, free for this attack. This promised attack or counterattack by the 7th Armored Division through our position uh, is very critical because it influenced all of the, the division's decisions from there on out. Since the 7th Armored Division was to counterattack through Colonel Riggs' position to the east, General Hoag was instructed to attack to the southeast when his armor arrived. There, another regiment of the 106th was cut off. But the 7th Armored Division was headquartered some 60 miles away to the north in Holland. And there was little urgency in the cry for help that finally reached his commander, General Robert Hasbrook. It was a quiet day, but along about 5.30 p.m., I received a very laconic message from 9th Army, which read, prepare your command for movement to Century. Century was the code name for the 8th Corps. I immediately sent for my G2 to learn the situation down there. And from the Shafe situation report, it appeared that it was a very quiet front where troops were sent to rest or to be indoctrinated, new green troops to be indoctrinated. After receipt of this message, I decided to send General Bruce Clark, who commanded Com Combat Command B, immediately to Bastogne, the headquarters of Century, to learn the situation and what our probable mission would be. I arrived in Bastogne about 2 o'clock in the morning of the 17th of December, reported to General Middleton, was told what he knew about the situation, which uh, I was impressed was not too much. And I was told that after I had had some sleep, I would go the next morning to St. Beth and report oh, yeah. to General Jones and move my command there and give him some help. During the first night of the Battle of the Bulge, the, infiltra uh, the enemy infiltrated between our lines uh, and into our rear areas. We didn't see very many Germans. Of course, now we know that they were moving in on both sides of us, that we had been almost cut off. Since the Schnee Eiffel is practically covered with trees, the terrain is extremely obscure. The young soldier hears fire from the right, from the left, behind him, and in front of him. Some people advance, others go back. There was quite some confusion, which facilitated our advance through the Schnee Eiffel toward Schoenberg. I met the first prisoners at noon on December 18th, on my way from the northern part of the Schnee Eiffel via Bleialf to Schönberg. I must say they seemed rather confused. The questioning of young people confirmed that this was a division which apparently had been newly assembled, or at least contained a great number of men with no war experience. Von kriegsunerfahrenen Leuten hier in Stellung war. Zwar war die Operation planmäßig angelaufen. The operation had been initiated according to schedule. The Seventh Army, attacking from the Eiffel front, gained a considerable amount of terrain. The Fifth Panzer Army, advancing north of the Seventh Army, had also gained some ground, especially since they had apparently managed to surprise the Americans along the entire front. On the morning of the 17th, word reached Sam Vith of a German penetration coming from the east toward Colonel Riggs' position. The division commander asked me to set up, ordered me, as a matter of fact, to set up a defense line astride the Schoenberg Sanvith Road to hold that road for the promised counterattack to the 7th Armored and uh, as an escape route for our two empty regiments to the front. 
The armor that might have relieved Colonel Riggs, General Hoag's combat command, had passed through St. Vith at dawn heading southeast on its mission to attack Winterspelt. The 7th Armored Division had left Holland before dawn, but its destination was Bastogne. There, General Hasbrook arrived well ahead of his columns, only to learn that the trouble was somewhere else. I proceeded uh, from Bastogne to San Vith and joined General Clark, who had arrived there some time previously, and we found the situation rather desperate to the east of San Vith. Smoke and noise coming from the woods about two miles east of San Vith indicated German tanks were there. And the only American troops between these Germans and the town of San Vith was a company of the 168th Engineers of the 106th Division. Well, I arrived at St. Vith at 10.30 in the morning, and General Jones needed help. Yes. Uh, then the problem was to get my command that was marching behind me turned off at Vilsam to come to St. Vith. Well, my greatest problem on the 17th of December was confusion and traffic on the road. Oh. Uh, your initial success on the 16th of December had started a lot of vehicles like supply vehicles, extra headquarters vehicles, and uh, service vehicles uh -huh. going to the rear. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This became so uh, severe at the road junction to the west of St. Vith that I had to go out and play military policeman yes. and direct the traffic to get it flowing to the front. And uh, I'm sure that you had the same problem because there's only one road from Prim towards St. Vith through the Ardennes. Genau die gleiche Situation, General. Ich war am 17. Nachmittag. Exactly the same situation, General. On the afternoon of the 17th, I was on my way to Schoenberg in a small vehicle, and I had to dismount because it was impossible for me to get ahead on this road. I then walked toward the front and tried to make myself useful as a military policeman. It was hopeless to try to untangle this column of vehicles when suddenly I heard someone calling in a very loud voice. Way up at the front, I thought I saw a military policeman, and I approached him. I saw that it was my superior, Field Marshal Modell, who had the same intention as I. So we continued our efforts together and tried to separate the column, but until nightfall on the 17th, a certain confusion and perplexity remained, since we were not able to separate the vehicles. Of course, General, you realize as well as anybody does that battle is organized confusion. Yes. Or at least the job of the general is to see that the confusion is not too disorganized. One human element in the confusion was 7th Armored Division Private Bill Dassinger. Sometime in December, we were going down this country road, and all of a sudden we come upon this great confusion. Jeeps, trucks, bed, equipment, going the opposite way. Well, you stop to think, uh, what are we getting ourselves into? And a little while later on, we sure found out. Another was Lieutenant Will Rogers, Jr. St. Vith, down a little kind of a side road. Now, at this particular time, the roads were jam-packed with traffic. All kinds of vehicles coming out of St. Vith. And we had to fight our way very slowly, mile after dreary mile, against this one-way stream of traffic. We arrived at a little town of Poto, which is a little crossroads Belgian village of about, oh, 10 or 12 small Belgian village farmhouses. 7th Armored Division Colonel V.L. Boylan was returning from Paris after a three-day pass. We came back in a Mercedes sedan which belonged to the commanding general at the time. And when we hit a crossroad where we would cut north to Holland to rejoin our units, we saw an armored column moving south and cutting to the east. It looked familiar, so we dismounted, went over and talked to the military police and found out it was our own division. Nobody would tell us where it was going, so we decided to follow it. 
The armored columns, like hundreds, thousands of other troops and vehicles on the 17th of December, was approaching Saint-Vith, Belgium. Converging from every direction, some came in pain and panic, some in cheerful confusion, some in desperate urgency. From the east, battered remnants of the 106th fought back toward friendly lines. From the south, units of the 28th Division were withdrawing before assaults of a magnitude no one could explain. And from north and west, the 7th Armored Division struggled on. Their arrival awaited with mounting impatience by General Clark in San Vith. Why this particular town? Why San Vith? Savit is really a very small place, and then it gained this tremendous significance. When planning the attack on Savit, we knew that it had to be captured at all costs, since it represented a traffic center, a junction of many, some six, eight roads, which cannot be bypassed. Savit had to be taken because all reserves which tried to attack the northern flank of my army, or the 6th Army in the north, had to come through Saint-Vith, just as you did. We were therefore very conscious of the importance of Saint-Vith and had planned its capture on the 17th of December. And I proceeded to leave and to join my unit at Saint-Vith. Unfortunately, I was unable to join it that night. We were shot off two of the roads and returned and left early the next morning. And I saw that we couldn't get on to Saint-Vith that night. So we went to sleep in a hayloft over a, what was apparently a, di a dairy. The rest of that night was spent still waiting for the 7th Armored Division and reinforcing our position. General Clark, formed a defense east of San Vith as fast as the troops arrived. They were fed piecemeal into this defensive line. And I fed them into the point of the horseshoe, which was being held by Colonel Riggs and others uh, to the east of St. Fifth. This went on practically all during the afternoon and night, and uh, all of my troops didn't close into the St. Fifth area until 3 o'clock the next morning. Sunday night, we were fighting desperately to get ourselves in a horseshoe arc position around the town. This area was the nearest to the enemy, the eastern approaches, about 2,000 yards east of the town. American troops under the command of the 7th Armored Division attempting to hold the town away from them. I am Colonel Don Boyer, United States Army. At that time, Major 38th Armored Infantry Battalion, 17 December, 1944. The first arrivals were the reconnaissance troop of the 7th Armored, which I immediately deployed with their automatic weapons in this skirmish line that we'd established, but placed them on the left side uh, overlooking the open field of fire where they could better utilize their automatic weapons. The rest of that day was spent assembling uh, any other support we could find. Uh, included in that support, by the way, were some medium tanks that we were able to uh, secure from the 9th Armored Division. 8 o'clock, Monday morning, 18 December, we were hit with our first attack. The Germans punched a hole in our lines. We counterattacked and restored the line. Two tanks knocked out, one assault gun destroyed where the enemy losses in this attack. Between 11.30 and 12.30 on that Monday, the Germans again attacked us. At the end of an hour, our line still held, but we had started the long roll of losses. The Battle of the Bulge had begun. More than 50 German columns were now attacking through the Ardennes. There were penetrations everywhere. South of San Vith, the 28th Division was split. Chaos ruled to the east where most of the 106th was surrounded. 
General von Manteuffel's forces were approaching Sanvith itself from three sides. At stake was not simply a town, but the timetable of the Ardennes counteroffensive. And it was already one irrecoverable day behind. Next, part two of the battle at Sanvith. of December 1944, the conflict that would become the Battle of the Bulge was two days old. And it started with a huge German counteroffensive planned with a strict timetable. By the 18th, two Panzer armies should have reached the Meuse River, driving toward their objective, Antwerp. Instead, thousands of Hitler's finest troops were still fighting to take a small town in the Belgian Ardennes. junction of roads and railways. The key to success for the counteroffensive was its timetable. A key to the timetable was Sam Vip. Massive German assault had achieved its first object, surprise. It had overwhelmed the inexperienced American troops in the forests east of Sam Vith, where some, like Colonel Oliver Patton, then a Green Lieutenant in the 106th Division, were still trying to fight back to friendly lines on the 18th. We made a last attack down toward the schoenberg Blayoff Road, and in that attack, I was hit for the second time that day. I was hit through both legs, and I couldn't walk. Late that night, I remember the battalion commander came through and told us that the battalion had to pull out. They had orders to continue to try to break out back toward American forces. And they were going to leave us. There were four or five of us in the H station. They would leave us with the medic. To the south, the German attack had split the 28th Division, cut off the 112th Infantry of Colonel Gustin Nelson. That afternoon, I received orders from division, which was then at Bastogne, to fall back on Toiliers and fight stiff delaying action, direction Bastogne. I knew that this was impossible. The German attack in this sector was being made by troops of the 5th Panzer Army. The capture of Sam Vith with its roads and railways was vital to their advance. They had been expected to take Sam Vith on the day before with little resistance, and on the 18th their commander, Veteran General Hasso von Manteuffel came up himself to see what was delaying their advance. Ich vermutete, dass es sich doch nur um einzelne I suspected the presence of scattered, though very courageous forces, which had come here from Savit or other directions to assist the fighting troops. I was under the impression that up to the 17th and 18th these small, scattered battle troops were not under centralized command. However, on the evening of the 18th, before nightfall, it became obvious that new enemy forces were approaching. The general's surmise was correct. But American intelligence of the size of the German attack was still so limited that some units of the 9th and then 7th armored divisions hastily strung out to extend the American defenses from the original roadblock to a long horseshoe line. We're still unaware that even a little crossroads like Poteau could be vital. There, most troops had already withdrawn when Lieutenant Will Rogers, Jr. woke on the morning of the 18th 
to word that a German tank was in the street below. So we raced around to my Jeep to get this bazooka. And the rest was sheer Laurel and Hardy. We couldn't get the strap off because it was covered with mud. Finally, we fought and got the bazooka unstrapped, and then we got it tangled up in, the, uh, in some camouflage netting. I was so excited that when I grabbed for the rockets, I took them out, and they dumped and fell down into the mud. Finally, we got everything all set, went down to the edge of this uh, long hedge, and here was a German tank, very thankfully waiting, just right there, waiting for us. We got the bazooka all set, started to fire at this tank, nothing happened. We'd forgot to wire the terminals properly. Finally, we got the terminals wired. We got off one shot at this tank. Big, uh, big explosion by the tank, but we couldn't see any result. However, the German officer in the tank closed down the turret and slowly backed down out of this little uh, Belgian town of Poto. The significance of any threat to the defensive horseshoe was clear to the man who was building it, 7th Armored Division Commander General Robert Hasbrook. Early on the 18th, I received bad news. The crossroads town of Poteau, which lay to the left rear of General Clark, up at San Beath, had been captured by the Germans. Since there was a road leading from Poteau directly to General Clark's rear, it was imperative that this be recaptured at once. Accordingly, I ordered CCA, my division reserve located at Biho, to proceed immediately and recapture Poteau. The northern front of Sam Fifth's defenses was being held by the 7th Armored Division's Combat Command B under General Bruce C. Clark. It became apparent that a command post in the town of St. Fifth was too far forward. And so in the afternoon, I sent my aide back around to the vicinity of Krombach to find a place where we could move and move into a room where there were tables and chairs, a place for messengers and liaison officers to park, a room that could be blacked out so we could use it the night. The 19th of December was characterized by strong probing attacks by the Germans all around the defensive horseshoe. Most of these attacks were about one company in size and were apparently looking for a soft spot. On the southern front of the Horseshoe, Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division found itself backed up against a deep railroad cut and embankment which could not be crossed. Its commander, General William Hogue, fought side by side with General Clark throughout the rest of the battle. In order that General Clark, who was on my left, would know what I was doing, I conferred with him and told him of the situation and that I intended to withdraw through St. Vith and take up the new line on his right after dark on the night of the 19th. This very difficult operation was carried out in complete darkness and was very successful. We were most happy that that had occurred some two nights later when the attack took place which drove us out of the forward end of the horseshoe and took St. Vith. As the morning of the 20th dawn, we of the 7th Armored felt pretty lonely. We had enemy on all sides and on our rear. We were out of touch with the 8th Corps, which I later learned had been forced to retreat from Bastogne to Neuf Chateau down in France. Accordingly, I decided to send a staff officer of mine, Lieutenant Colonel Schroeder, to try and locate 1st Army headquarters and apprise them of our situation and ask for help. The defenses east of St. Vith still held. Their Colonel, then Major, Don Boyer was in the point of the horseshoe. Communications were sparse, but they were sufficient to pass requests for artillery fires and exchange the necessary coordination for the attacks of the various battalions of the division as we received attacks from the Germans and kicked them out with counterattack after counterattack. Colonel V. L. Boylan was in the Horseshoe's northern curve. I can't recall too many details at that time of specific attacks because it seems that they went on around the clock. And the battlefield is a, an extremely lonesome place. Uh, 
is not milling with people. You don't see much. You hear things, tanks blowing up, artillery, small rounds, and things like that. For a private like Bill Bassinger, the battlefield was everywhere. Minute by minute, things change. I only know what it is to be in a, just that little hole. Maybe a squad or two around us. That's all we know. We know that little bit of territory that we have. You were constantly getting rumors. I remember one time we heard that the brightest spot on the Western Front was St. Fifth. Many men believed the rumors that different units had pulled out and in turn were panicked. I remember reading one of Jim Thurber's book, Stories, which is entitled, The Day the Dam Broke. And it seemed so apropos to this situation that I ask every member of my staff to read that book and take it to heart. Continued attacks went on during the day on both of the Combat Command Bs. And my G2, towards the end of the day, told me that we had prisoners of war in our prisoner of war enclosure who were identified from five German divisions. This seemed impossible to me, but later events proved it to be correct. The defensive horseshoe was now a good 25 miles long, reinforced by Colonel Nelson's regiment that had lost touch with its division. But the line was being pounded from a horseshoe into a fortified goose egg. Lieutenant Patton knew why. He was riding wounded on the hood of a jeep, driven by a German officer back toward a German aid station. There were two things going on on that road that even a lieutenant as green as I was could uh, add up and make sense out of. First thing, of course, was the number of troops moving west along that road, infantry on either side of the road, and the other was the number of vehicles coming down. Tanks, trucks, flak wagons, cars. They were the biggest tanks I'd ever seen in my life. Every time one of those tanks would go by, I'd look at it, and Lieutenant would lean over and look at me and grin. As I occupied my positions here on the east, on the night of the 20th, 21st. Snow flurries in the air, all of us with frostbite, some with frozen fingers and frozen legs. To our front, to our right flank, to our left flank, all night long, we heard the noise of trucks and the noise of tanks moving into position. At last, the long-delayed, coordinated German attack on saint Vith fell. But General Hasbrook's search for First Army headquarters and his efforts to convince them that he was facing more than a local German counterattack had been successful. On the morning of the 21st, we were overjoyed to find that the 82nd Airborne had arrived in our general vicinity and had made a tenuous contact with us near the Vilsam Bridge. This was an eventful day in our sector. CCB of the 7th Armored was attacked by a full German corps. By noon, heavy concentrations of artillery started breaking on the woods in which my forces were located. Screaming Mimi barrages started. These sounded like a huge spring being compressed and then suddenly cut loose. It was a horrible din that came through the air down among the trees. I remember one unit commander who I had who several times reported to me that he had to be relieved or had to have reinforcements that he could only hold maybe another hour or sometimes three hours or sometimes eight hours. I remember telling him very definitely that, saying, how the hell do you know how long can you hold? You just hold there as long as you have the ability to fire back. Time meant nothing to me. But between 1,200 and 1,300 on the 21st until 2,300 hours or 11 o'clock that night, I saw my own immediate force, which had been in the neighborhood of 680 men, go to less than 200. The eastern point in the horseshoe defending Sanfit was now an island defending only itself. 
There, Colonel Thomas J. Riggs, the 106th Division engineer, whose roadblock had been the town's first defense, still held the road under his original orders. By that evening, the Germans were building up their intensity and were starting to break through on both of our flanks. By about midnight, we'd lost communication on both flanks with the two units, so we knew we were being completely isolated. Knowing that Sanvif now was filled with German troops coming in from the east, the north, and the south. Peeled off to the right until we got in the vicinity of the road that led to Prum. And there we broke off into five and eight man groups. I gave them a compass bearing and told them to try to work their way to the west to rejoin General Clark, Combat Command B, where we might continue the fight. For by nightfall, I and the four men in my group were prisoners of the Germans. And I realized that in the furious fight in the day before, that I had been wounded, And for me, the world had come to an end at that point. Uh, we could then, in the dawn's light, see that all of the roads leading into Sanvif were full of German troops uh, concentrating on and going through uh, Sanvif. We obviously could not counterattack. I attempted at that time to split them up into patrols so they could uh, attempt to work their way back to the friendly lines, the U.S. lines. We started two of these patrols out and watched both of them captured. And shortly thereafter, uh, I was captured with the remainder of the group. On the afternoon of 21st December, General Clark informed me that the attack on St. Vest was becoming so heavy they would be forced out of that position that evening and said he would retreat to the west. I agreed to conform with his movement. The tremendous the attack, delay we had suffered so far in my schedule left its mark on the whole army in the Central Corps as well as in the southern sector. Waren meine Anstrengungen bis zum 22. Dezember dahin gerichtet, Until December 22nd, therefore, my efforts were concentrated on the coordination of the attack on Saint-Vit, in other words, the cooperation of all arms, the infantry, the storm guns, the artillery, the tanks, in a final attempt to take Saint-Vit. Und Sie sehen, wie groß die Schwierigkeiten waren, um diesen Angriff zu koordinieren. Das ist dann erst am 21. 22. gelungen, sodass wir dann zum Krieg endgültig in Besitz nehmen konnten. Aber der Zeitverlust war groß und daher die Bedeutung ihrer Verteidigung von St. Fit. As I remember the 22nd of December, I remember it as a day of mud and rain and considerable confusion. As you pressed your attack in the morning of the 22nd, against our new defensive line in the Kronbach area, our forces were driven back. And at the same time, pressure from the north and the south was applied against our flanks. So as a result, by the night of the 22nd, our force was back pretty much in a semicircle around the town of Komanster. It should be pointed out when the men were dispersed on the ground, they were like fingers of a hand. And as they withdrew, as I later pointed out to them, they gained strength by coming back, as the fingers would, in forming a fist. This gave them strength and coordination. Comanster would be the last defense. From there, General Clark immediately sought an escape route to the west, a dirt road through the woods to Vielsalm. And although the Battle of the Bulge would last for another month, its turning point had been reached. The defense of places like Sanvith had given the Allied armies what they needed, 
time to rally and regroup. Next morning, the skies were clear. The ground, which had been a sea of slush and mud that would have mired hopelessly the withdrawal of 23,000 men and their thousands of vehicles, was frozen hard. During the early morning hours of the 23rd, both CCB of the 7th Armored and CCB of the 9th Armored were hotly engaged with the enemy. It was difficult for them to disengage, but also during the day, the 82nd Airborne was attacked from the south. I finally sent a message to General Clark and General Hogue telling them it was imperative that they start their withdrawal. But if they did not start now, they'd be withdrawing into a bunch of Germans instead of into the ranks of the 82nd Airborne Division. There was no time to issue formal orders or orders under code. So I instructed that the radio to all units under my command be opened up and that the orders would be given in the clear. General Hasbrook told me that I would have to withdraw across the Viel Sound Bridge by noon or else the bridge would have to be blown because of the pressure of the German army coming in from his flanks. And I directed that the withdrawal would start immediately and would, the plan would be that, that they would withdraw down the dirt wood road on a first come, first served basis. This required that I personally direct traffic at the crossroads at uh, Comanster. So I started the battle as a military police, and I ended the battle as a military police. But of course, that was necessary. I met Bruce Clark in the town, where he was directing traffic at the time, trying to ease the confusion of the milling vehicles passing through. We went into position around the town. The withdrawal started at 7 AM and went on constantly throughout that day. It went very smoothly. The covering forces operated efficiently, and only one unit had trouble. That was Task Force Jones on the southern flank, the last to withdraw. So the American column passed through these little towns of Biho and Bovigny, and as they did, they became part of Task Force Jones, which was the rear guard of the American unit coming out of saint vie And my little platoon became part of the rear of the rear guard of the last unit out of saint -Vie. As we fell back onto the road to Somme Chateau, I found it choked with vehicles from uh, a task force of the 7th Armored Division. We attempted to work our way through these vehicles to find out what the trouble was, and we found that there was a burning tank in Somme Chateau and that the Germans had apparently come around behind us with an anti-tank gun. In the meanwhile, someone had discovered a side road up a sort of a side canyon that went up this high mountain beside this Somme River. And just then, a beautiful thing happened. A full, bright moon came up over the hills. We went up this side road and then across country. And in one place, we had to detail some of the tanks of the 7th Armored Division to pull the wheel vehicles over, this, over a highland swamp. And uh, about 2 o'clock in the morning, we finally wound up behind the 82nd Airborne lines. Mile after mile, and we came out through the snow, this brilliant, beautiful moonlight night, and then we saw another wonderful sight. About every 100 feet or so, we saw a man in a white parka standing there, and that was the 82nd Airborne. And we came out through the 82nd Airborne Division, out of the Battle of uh, the Bulge, out of saint -Vite and that was Task Force Jones. We were the tail end of the rear guard of the 7th Armored Division. I climbed up the slope in there where I was greeted by General Hasbrook, drawn, tired, out on his feet, but still the type of a commander standing there with his troops to the very last minute, threw his arms around me and said, Boylan, thank God you got him out. And. Uh... Toward the end, I figured that I got uh, practically no sleep for the last 72 hours before reporting to General Hasbrook behind the 82nd Airborne lines. 
I wished him a Merry Christmas. It was the day before, but I wished him a Merry Christmas. But to us, it was just a big step to get home. I was and still am proud of the men and officers of the 106th Infantry Division with whom I went through such a dreadful bath of blood during this action. I was so proud, as a matter of fact, that I returned to that unit after escaping from prisoner of war camp some 28 days later. It is the war of the small men, the outpost commanders, the section commanders, the company commanders, those were the decisive people here who were responsible for success or failure, victory or defeat. We depended upon their courage. They could not afford to get confused and had to act according to their own decisions until the higher command was again in a position to take over. I believe I can say, and I have the right to make this judgment, that the Germans did this admirably well. At the same time, however, I am also convinced that this was the case with the American forces, who, after all, succeeded in upsetting the entire time schedule, not only of the attacking unit in Saint-Vite, but also of the 5th and 6th Panzer armies. That is a fact which cannot be denied. Just one month later in January, you can imagine how we felt the satisfaction of regaining what we had been forced to lose. There was snow on the ground. Small road leading down to the right, a few farmhouses and trees, and St. Vith itself. No movement, no noise, no dogs, no smoke. Lifeless, flattened. Such is the rush of history that Sanvith, Belgium, is almost lost in it now. But not in the memories of those who made history there that winter, or those who must take life up again when history is past. And then we came back, one by one. The first to return were my father and my elder brothers. But when we came back, things weren't over yet, by far. Everything was destroyed here. That wasn't too bad. Somehow children don't care too much for material values. But the destroyed tanks were a horror. Everywhere, sometimes there were still burned bodies inside. Soldiers, Germans, Americans. And when we were playing sometimes, or ventured into the woods, which was very dangerous, when we tried to jump across a trench or something, suddenly we saw, we were startled with horror because there was a body lying in there. But gradually things came back to normal. Accidents were less frequent and in time they were forgotten. And then it went on like that. And in spite of everything, we grew up and became strong. But still, something has remained. Sometimes when one talks about it, it comes back to one's memory, how awful it is. Well, one of the things that's always bothered me most about the Battle of San Beat is that a number of heroic actions went un unrecognized and unrewarded. Uh, of course, there were a good many silver stars and bronze stars awarded because I had delegated that authority to my commanders and they carried them in their pockets and were authorized to put them on the man at the time. But the higher decorations, which many deserved, were not forthcoming because the sworn statements of witnesses were hard to get in the heat of battle. Afterwards, the witnesses were gone in some cases, and in others, the act was forgotten only too soon.